By the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, Comedy on Power Talk. Thank you so much for making us part of your day today. And as I continue to traverse the musical landscape of our cultural history, it is so humbling to be able to connect with the really cats that um, came up and had just an indelible mark on really music in general both in the studio and on the bandstand and these cats came from all different parts of the country you know having the opportunity to interview people like phil upchurch from chicago or steve cropper from stacks records or you know just in general uh the even the idea of somebody like louis shelton going out to the wrecking crew from uh, little rock arkansas um, all these little pockets of regional, you know, sound uh, created um, these individual uh, records that were made by real human beings uh, in the studio, hitting at the same time. And um, obviously you fuse that with spirituality and, you know, then you realize that um, collectively as a whole, the unit is greater than the sum of its parts. And then, you know, the music becomes bigger and transcends the person themselves. And I get a chance today to speak to somebody who really is a, is a hero to many of his peers. Uh, he's uh, helped them through hard times and also done a lot of just amazing service in the name of spirit, source, God. And uh, on top of that, has had a decorated career as a musician, as a guitar player. Hadley Hawkinsmith, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, thank you, Jake. You know, as you were talking about, uh, you mentioned the name Louis Shelton. Mm -hmm. He goes way back, and he's, he was a great, tasty uh, studio guitarist. And uh, a lot of people don't know, but he was one of Larry Carlton's favorite guitarists, and Larry learned a lot from Louis. Well, it's funny, because uh, over the last year, during the pandemic, I... I tracked down Dean Parks, and then Dean connected me with Louie. Louie, and then so Louie talked about him and, and Larry pretty in-depth in the studio playing off of each other and how um, it was just this beautiful brotherhood. Um, and Larry shared the post on Facebook. So they are, the cool thing about Louie is that he came in and, you know, the original Wrecking Crew guys, The you know, you can maybe throw Barney Kessel in there, maybe... Uh, oh, yeah. uh, maybe uh, uh, Tedesco, like those guys, like rock, nobody knew how to arrange for rock music per se. And those guys could play rock music, but they didn't like it. You know, they didn't, they were beboppers, the original wrecking crew, but <laughs> Louis, Louis was like one of those first real, you know, they, like the producers would say like, play that swamp thing or play that, play that Jimi Hendrix thing. You know, they didn't even know how to, they didn't even know what the word was. And I'm just, I, I guess that's a good place to start is I know you weren't dwelling in the studios in the early to mid sixties yet per se, but you know, when, like I remember interviewing Dennis Coffey and, and he'd go to uh, his high school band teacher and ask him about certain chord progressions and rock tunes. And they didn't even know how to, how to teach him. Because it was such a there, there was no word in the lexicon for rock. Where were you in that in that milieu? Well, I became smitten at a pretty early age, probably around fourteen or fifteen, uh, with blues guitar. My my heroes were BB uh, King, Freddie King, <laughs> all the Kings, Albert King, sure, Albert Collins. Uh, just amazing guitarist. And so for a while I was kind of uh, is kind of myopic. I was just focused on this one genre. But shortly after that, the Beatles hit. And I just, I opened my mind to much more, uh, more melodic music. I mean, blues is melodic in a way. But more than that, it's soulful. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and so, although I listened to all the pop radio stuff, and I always loved it, I mean, I just love a great song when I hear it. And I was also smitten by James Jamerson, the bass player at Motown, uh, 
up until I heard him, I was very content to just play guitar. But after I heard how crucial his bass lines were to those songs, uh, I, I just I had to learn how to play bass too. So <laughs> well, the, the, anyway. that's so fa- that's so fascinating. Well, there's a couple things. First of all, can you talk a little bit? This is kind of a heavy question right away, but um, so much of the uh, the Motown rhythm section, they're, they'd play counterpoint to the vocals all the time. It was so hypnotic. That's what created the groove. And we've, yeah. we kind of got away from that in modern pop music and all kinds of music. I mean, was that part of the intoxication? Were you aware that they were playing counterpoint to those to those vocals and how much... I mean, because that's what gives the buoyancy to the music, you know? Well, I agree. I I don't think I had looked at it that way, but I totally agree with what you're saying about it. Uh, was that, you, like, you put, but I mean, you played your bass that way, too, is what I'm saying. Like, you were playing counter. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I love it. I never wanted to be, like, a guitar player playing bass or, or what they might call lead bass. <laughs> right, lead bass, yeah. I want yeah. that. In <laughs> fact, my bass... Although it's just a four-string bass, it's a Fender, classic Fender bass, I tune the whole thing down a fourth because I love the sound of those really low notes, which means I can go all the way down to a B. Right, right. And, uh, you know, uh, and and James Jamerson, he, he knew to stay down low. I mean, he would go up high when, when it might be... Uh, helpful for one little part of a song but he stayed down low and he just played the groove it's so good to hear your voice Hadley I mean the, the I want to read you this quote I I'm not sure if you were ever hip to the uh the the group Johnny Talbot and the Thangs did you ever hear the, that group I don't think I I did so they were in this he Johnny Talbot you know a lot of you know my generation Gen Xers younger we think that um you know, Sly Stone created funk, the, the 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 funk music. But actually, in the early '60s in Oakland, uh, you know, you had Hank Ballard and the Midnighters, you had Dyke and the Blazers, what? and you had this group Johnny Talbot and the Fangs. And he really was one of he was the original Oakland funk guitar player. And and I, I did this interview with him. He's very jaded. He has, um, you know, he basically said to me, you know the Sly got Sly integrated his band and uh, toned down the lyrics, and that's why he wound up on Ed Sullivan. They were not going to take his brand of funk, Johnny's brand. But right. this is what he said to me, and I know you're a big West fan, and I I just want to read this. I I asked him if he ever ran into the Montgomery Brothers because they were always they had a a room at the Booker T Washington Hotel in San in San Francisco, and he said this, and you can riff on it, being that you grew up in a blues bag, which this leads right into this, so I want to read this to you. He said, The Montgomery brothers were playing jazz. They couldn't hang with blues musicians. You can make a blues musician a jazz musician, but you can't make a jazz musician a blues musician. Jazz comes out of the blues. It doesn't go the opposite way. If you tried to make a white boy from Walnut Creek play country western, that would be hard for him too. The music was the music was born out of a lot of patience and plowing fields, and anybody who didn't do that can't play the blues. You can go from the bottom from the bottom up, but it's hard to come down. Now, just for the record, Wes Montgomery had eight kids, was a cement mixer in Indianapolis. He definitely lived the blues. Maybe he wasn't sharecropping. But I wanted to talk to you, Hadley, about this idea, especially more in the modern context of of what whatever that label jazz means, do you, um, do, how do you feel about the idea that a blues, you know, that you, you really need to have the fundamentals of the blues, you know, Cannonball, Train, Sonny Rollins, Alan Toussaint, Earl Palmer, all those guys were playing, were walking the bar and playing R&B and blues before they started to get into maybe more sophisticated bebop. Where today yeah. you have, it's more mental, it's more intellectual exercises in jazz. It's much more about facility and technique, but yet maybe they don't go back far enough. But I'd lo- I couldn't think of asking anyone better, somebody who was steeped in the blues, it, how you, if you can talk a little bit about if you agree with the fact that 
you can go from the bottom up, but it's really hard to come down. Uh, I would say it may be harder to come down, but there are certain people I know, and I think Larry Carlton would be one of them, Mm -hmm. can play just ripping jazz, but he has the feel of the blues, and it even goes over into his jazz playing, but he can also turn around and just play some killer blues. Uh, So there are exceptional people who can do that, but I agree with what you say, that normally that's not the case. Because what happens sometimes, I I knew a great jazz uh, guitarist in Oklahoma City, and he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, Mm. because he had great technique and stuff. And, you know, someone called him to play on a rock thing, maybe a session or or a country thing. And they say, oh, I play jazz, you know, I can play that kind of stuff in my sleep. Right. He came in, and no one liked what he played. <laughs> it, it wasn't authentic. Right, you know what right. I, mean? I totally do. Yeah, I love it. So um, that can happen. And, uh, Let me ask you, though, Hadley, like, I mean, because, like, Miles Davis grew up pretty wealthy. Um, he could still play the blues. I mean, can you talk about how you developed emotion in your playing, and maybe even if you – I mean, I think it's authenticity is key. So what what was something in your life early on that created a blues image, for lack of a better word? Because it doesn't necessarily, you either you have it, you know, you can play it. You don't necessarily have to be coming from the cotton fields, you know. You, you just, it has, yeah. you have to feel, how did you learn to feel music? And was there some kind of uh, demarcation point you know, early in your life that gave you a a larger view of humanity and the ups and downs of life? I think most people would agree, excuse me. I'm just getting over a little bronchitis or something. Oh, okay. I agree that um, blues and even uh, black gospel music, which is very close to blues in a lot of ways. The blues came out of it, actually, uh, was fraught with pain. There was a lot of pain. You know, uh, those those black people were really struggling to live back then. Absolutely. And uh, my source of pain was different. I, I was raised in kind of a not well-to-do family, but we were doing okay. My father was an attorney. But I came down with a crushing case of depression when I was only like 12 years old. And it stayed with me for a good 15 or 20 years. And I'm talking, you know, I I actually had to miss some schooling because of it. And uh, it was during that time I became really attracted to the blues, and I really think that the pain of depression hmm. helped me to dig into it more. Wow. Uh, I just I just remember listening to those records, and Wes Montgomery was one of those records that I would listen to late at night to go to sleep, and I just thought, that feel. There is so much feel there and feeling. I said, I've got to tap into that. And I, back then I was thinking, well, I'm a white boy. I probably can't ever do that well. <laughs> Uh, But as I got a little older, I thought, you know what? We're all free spirits, and if we really feel something, we can play it. And uh, uh, I just got into it, and I think the fact that I was going through some major depression at the time uh, just made me relate to it and want it even that much more. Can you, as best you can, can you talk about the fe- what that made why it made you more relaxed when you heard that that bluesy you know that feel like it, it you know because i mean i i've dealt with my own anxiety um you know it, i didn't have depression in the sense of like you know not being able to get out of bed but i oftentimes just had my own you know bed of neuroses in my own mind and just sometimes just throwing on certain music uh it doesn't maybe it's like joe farrell with John McLaughlin and Chick Corea, you know, just 
certain imagery or moods or whatever it develops, it, it always gave me peace. Do you remember, can you talk a little bit about what that blues feeling that gate, why it gave you peace amidst the darkness that you were feeling inside or in your head? Yeah, I, uh, I like all types of blues and some of the blues I like and a lot of the blues that I play, I would consider more melodic. Sure. Not necessarily a screaming, distorted guitar sound, but a sound where you can actually play melodies and emote things. You st you're still bending strings and doing that nice blues vibrato. But it, in other words, it doesn't all have to be gut bucket. To, to have, <laughs> yeah, I love that you word. Know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I, dude, I really dig. Go ahead, continue. Uh, so, for me, it was like there was a close relation between the blue, the blues, and beautiful music. Right. In other words, I used to listen to Chet Baker on flugelhorn, mm. and that was so soothing. But there was a lot of depth there. It wasn't like, oh, he's just playing jet. No, he was, he was playing what he felt, you know, deep in his heart, and it came across so clear to me. Uh, and that's true of Wes Montgomery. Um, golly. Well, no, I want to go deeper on no, this. I'll tell this... you what. Go ahead. Since you interviewed Dean Parks, yeah, Dean is a fine blues guitarist. Really he gets... fine, yeah. Oh, man. And let me tell you, the, the years that I worked with Dean and Koinonia were magic. I, I felt like I learned so much from him about not playing over other people and uh, the spirit of camaraderie, the, the spirit of uh, we're going to function as one unit, not individual players. You know, I want, you know, you talk... I, I, I'm not, I'm a non-musician, so I might come across as like, you know, saying things that are pithy, but I really can't, you know, it's not like I can read music or I can play drums a little bit, but you know, this is from my interview with David T. Wall. You know that you love music and that's the main thing. Yeah. And I love the musicians, you know, and I love your point of view. So it, it I, I dig, but you know, this is what David T. Walker told me and I wanted you to talk about Oklahoma city or, and, or the regional area that you came from. He said, there were blues players in Southern California who were surprisingly good. They didn't have the famous name, but they were musicians who could play all kinds of music. They could play a 12-bar blues and run through all kinds of substitutions solo-wise. In my right. first few years of playing, I didn't quite understand how they could do that. Mel Brown was certainly one of them. He had the facility and knowledge that it takes to run through chord changes and the albums he did on ABC Impulse were all out of the blues. He could do all types of things. And he talked, sure. he said, Etta James was on the bandstand. She liked the jazz, even though she didn't sing a lot of it. In these vamps that we would do, she would take it outside of the chord. It would still have the funk and the <laughs> feeling, but you couldn't go too far out for her. She didn't care what you did on the vamp going out. She would take it out as far as you wanted to go. You know, and I'm fascinated with this, you know, I don't, get off like it's like the classic line someone told me like uh you know they were at a drum clinic with Indugu, the late great Indugu Chancellor who I knew very well and he um you know there's some guy on stage and he's going off on a drum solo for like 15 minutes and you know it's just massive facility and all and then whoever was with him looked over and Indugu was just snoring he had passed out you know <laughs> like it was so non-scintillating for him and yes you know, and it's like this, like, it's in the cracks. It's like this subtle, gritty, bluesy playing like Mel Brown. And I'm just wondering, like, were there cats in and around that you might have gone to check out that were similar players? You know, they, you know, they were never going to be, they didn't want to be Talf. They didn't want to be some, you know, bebop. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but they were really bluesy, but they were able to play sophisticated blues. Yes, I, I, I did. Uh, you know, at the time when I was growing up in Oklahoma City in the uh, early and mid-60s, um, it was a thing. A lot of people think, well, it must all be country music in Oklahoma City, but uh, it was a blues thing. 
you know, I was not the only guitar player in town that was really into the blues, you know, and trying to play it authentically and convincingly. There were a lot of guys, and we kind of inspired each other. You might say a friendly competition. (laughs) Absolutely, because there was enough work to go around, you know? Yes, there was. And, uh, you know, if, if there was a new guy in town, we knew about him, and we'd go hear him. And uh, there was a lot of great black guitarists in in Oklahoma City at that time as well that I used to love to hear. Any any I know they probably don't have big names, but are there any? Because I mean, I, I was even like transcribing my interview with this guy Hawk Walensky, this B three player and in Chicago. He snuck out of his mom's house when he was sixteen, and there's this guy Prince James, who there's nothing on this guy, but basically he was playing organ in on the south side of Chicago, and and he looked, he, you know, they were playing in like a storefront. And he turned around, he saw Hawk, like, shivering outside, told him to come in. He said, hey, man, he's like, how old are you? He's like, 16. He's like, you love the organ? He's like, yeah, a lot. He's like, you sit right there. And then he got this, <laughs> just, and, and, like, that's, to me, is, like, that's the connection. Was there, were there some cats, like, unsung cat or one or two names that, that you can point to that were inspiring that you would go and, and dig on? I am pretty bad with names. It's okay. If you if you can't do it... These people, yeah. I just went and heard. I maybe got to hear them once or twice. Right. Uh, back then, there, were, there was definitely kind of a white side of town and a black side of town. Sure. These guys were playing bars in the uh, black side of town, and sometimes it was a little dangerous. I, I got a knife pulled on me one night, uh, well, you know, it's, I'm glad to hear this because I never, you know, you, you hear about, I mean, Michael Bloomfield, people like that. They had to go and seek out the music and you hear about, I consistently hear about the, how warm they were treated, how accepting it was. I have to believe I would have been getting my ass kicked if I went to the black side of town, you know, I mean, it's, it's a little precarious sometimes. So, I mean, but this, this particular man was obviously very drunk, right? And he was probably a prejudiced man, but the fact is, most of those folks, uh, as soon as you started playing, and they, you could tell, or they could tell, that you were really relating and cared about the music, you could win them over. Sure. And uh, I want to be clear it, about something, Hadley. You that certainly was the exception. That that didn't happen to me much. I, you know, the, the, but I, I just want to be clear about something that because I was talking to a a bass player yesterday he's a little bit younger than you but you know his first exposure were you exposed to the clapton john mayall blues and then got hip to the fact that they were influenced by all these american blues players or were you already tapped into all the reeds did they come first before the british invasion quote unquote that's that's very interesting because i was already zoned in on what I considered the authentic, I love it, uh, blues playing, and and of course almost all my idols were black. Um, and by the way, since you're into the spiritual aspect, I used to actually be mad at God because He didn't make me black. Wow, that's deep, really, man. <laughs> that is really well, it's, deep. It's strange. And now as I'm. Uh, a more mature Christian, I realize that's ridiculous. God doesn't make any mistakes. Sure. You know, but uh, that's how strongly I felt about that music and how much I wanted to be able to play it authentically. Uh, I think I lost my train of no, thought. It's, no, yet. I'm, I'm going to help you. That's why I'm here. I you know the. How did you, being coming from a you know uh, well-to-do family, was was there bleed through radio stations? How did you originally get hip? to the the original blues masters of this country? Uh, There were a couple of black radio stations. KBYE was the one that I loved, and the uh, disc jockey, uh, Big Ben Tipton. Oh, man, here we go. He loved the blues. (laughs) He was the first time I heard Albert Collins, and this is when Albert was totally new, and his style of blues playing was nothing like say bb king or albert king those other guys he he played in a different tuning and he used a capo most of the time and he played uh, the guitar like a bass player would with his first two fingers really 
Oh, man. Oh, man, it that's was cool. Oh, so great. It was so great, and I, I would pull over the car sometimes. I had a, a funky uh, Volkswagen Beetle back then. <laughs> I would pull over the car so I could just listen and absorb it. And then, of course, I, I later bought the records and probably wore them out trying to learn every nuance of of how to play like Albert Collins but without using a tuning or a capo. And uh, that was a... Uh, that was a hard thing, but I'm so glad I made myself do it. Well, Hadley, I mean, I've been after you for quite some time. I, I there's a few reasons um, I do my show, and um, and this is one of them. We we have a game on this program called Name That Voice. Um, take a listen to this, and then uh, and listen to the story, and we'll come back and break it down. Okay. And, uh, you know, I was with no, no work with a new baby. I went back to Oklahoma, and then a band called Barefoot Jerry offered me a job no. in Nashville. Oh, my God. And so Wayne Moss and Matt Gaden. And I went there, and I, I, I think I played terrible. <clears throat> they weren't happy. I wasn't happy. And I left that and went back to Oklahoma, and uh, that's when I started going to this little church that Hadley Hawkinsmith was going and. And uh, this drummer was the speaker, and we just helped people that were in trouble. And that's how I met Andre, and that's what turned me around where I, you know, I stopped doing any kind of drugs. And <clears throat> everything went a lot better. My life was radically changed. But then I moved, when I moved to L.A., I immediately called Fred. I called Dean Parks, and when I started working with Andre, uh, Andre said, well, you get the musicians for me. So I called it. The guys that I knew and I liked, David Hungate, uh, I called in to play bass, and as I said, Joe Sample. Yeah, well, dude, and don't Hadley. even forget about the, the one of the most spirit. All right, Hadley, who is that? That is my longtime buddy, Bill Maxwell. You know, I, I, you're a hundred percent right, and um, you know, I, he goes into. I asked him to. I think in the second interview I did with him to go deeper. And it really was like, uh, I'm, it was, you know, I was raised somewhat agnostic. My mom was, had a Catholic upbringing. My dad was Jewish and I was always searching for spirituality. And I found it in my own way after a lot of seeking. And so much of my show is, is about the aesthetics of the, your experience. And so much of what I've delved into is the multidimensional self and, and really infusing spirit and urgency and intensity with the music in any genre. And he told me that, you know, we went deeper on this thing. He, you know, Bill was scuffling really hard and, and you were like, Hey man, you know, like come to, you know, let, let's, well, no, it was the open door mission. That's what That's it was. A- the open door mission. And, and it really, I, I honestly, it almost brought me to tears, man. I, I, and I, so I was trying to get you to come on my show way back when, because I, I was just so, I was like, this is what it's really about, man. Like these guys, you were playing for people that it was all darkness for them at that point, or they had no, you know, they were, and I just, I've, I've just, my whole show has been dedicated to the unsung and the underdog and just really beautiful people who walk the righteous path, the spiritual path, not man's view of God and the vanity of all that stuff, but just doing what you can in this time, in the moment, in this life to affect positive change through your creator. And I just wanted you to talk even pre, I mean, you saved Bill's life. You guys helped, you know, I mean, but, but how did you find the open door mission and what church, I mean, can you just talk about that time in your life and how, you connected sure. with that church? Okay, first of all, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, I was suffering with severe depression. Uh, I guess they would call it clinical depression. And uh, I got so depressed while I was touring. I think we were in Tulsa with the Third Avenue Blues Band. That was uh, Bill Maxwell, Harlan Rogers, Fletch Wiley. Oh, crazy uh, band. Yeah, great group, great group. Oh, man. Yeah. It was, Harold Jones, I don't want to forget him. Great black singer, Harold Jones. Not the drummer, not Tony Bennett. I've interviewed you, so there was a singer. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, great. Uh, 
I actually tried to take my life. Uh, luckily, the hospital saved me. They pumped the turpentine or whatever it was out of my stomach. And uh, so I lived on, but I decided... I've got to just get out of music. I've got to just make a total change. And so I went back to Oklahoma City, uh, was still living with my parents because I was still pretty young. And uh, a friend of mine that I used to play in clubs with a long time ago, his name was Jimmy Hill, a very good drummer, and, and the band was called The Witnesses. And I used to sit in with them because they also love the blues. Well, Jimmy uh, had become a preacher. He had gotten saved and became a preacher, and he had this open-door mission. And he said, Hadley, I know you're going through a lot of dark times right now. Why don't you come and and worship with us and, uh, you know, get around some people who are positive and, and want to help you grow and stuff. And so that was the beginning of me and the open door. I think I was there probably two years uh, before the rest of the band, Third Avenue Blues Band, started dropping in and coming around. Uh, but Jimmy Hill and I got along great. Is I he still? So is he still people. with us, or is he? Is he? Is he still around? No, he he died of cancer. I think about five years ago. What was it about him, the charisma? I mean, I think this is so important, Hadley, because, like, you didn't... I mean, yeah, you probably sat in the pews and took in the gospel, but you didn't become a sheep. Like, you became a shepherd. You became somebody to... You you used your apparatus, the guitar, to affect people's hearts and minds, maybe even drop into their soul. I mean, can you remember the earliest days of playing at the open door, and did you ever question it, or did you feel like... At a certain, because you know, like everyone's like just, you know, they, in today's world, especially in the music world, you know, they say run to the corner, we'll give you a hundred bucks, you'll do it, because it's just so, you know, jobs are uh, scarce, right. and here you guys are playing for drug addicts and and alcoholics and 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 for no money, and 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 you know, I mean, can you, like that to me is like that's devotion, right? That that is a spiritual path. I think that's why I connected with it, because so yeah. much, you know, and I just wanted, what was that? Was there some doubt early on, or did, did it feel right right away? Um, because you weren't just sitting in the pews and and getting into groupthink with people and just you know thinking whatever everybody else just going to go with the flow. You took your true nature and tried to help the less fortunate. Yeah. Well, for starters, there were no pews. The building <laughs> that, that we had called that we named the Open Door mm. uh, used to be. Jimmy Hill's father's laundry, wow. laundry service, and uh, cleaners. And uh, so it was a pretty humble building, fairly small. We just used uh, folding chairs to sit in. I mean, everyone was comfortable and stuff, but we were there for one more reason, and that was love of God and love of each other. And that's what made it warm. And Jimmy Hill was not only an excellent preacher but he was such an example of love that it was amazing to me because i knew him earlier and although i always liked him he wasn't this loving person that he had become and um you know the open door uh bill may have covered this that's the church where andre came to hear us play our band called sunlight um, he no. Was, he said that this. Uh, he's. I'm just reading off, and this is the. He went into it a little bit deeper. He said, "I started playing the Open Door Mission with Harlan, Hadley, and Fletch Wiley. <clears throat> we're playing for drug addicts and old alcoholics that had no place to live, and we're giving them everything we have. And that's the coolest part. You were giving it all you had. I, I love it. You know. And we're. Oh yeah, we were, and and part of that was writing, writing our own music because we. We felt like we had experienced something that just totally changed our lives. And so we started writing songs about it. And, uh, you well, know, we still had our influences. There was some jazz influence, obviously some blues influence. But there was also a new joy 
that none of us had had before that was permeated that music. And I think that's what uh, caused people to be drawn to the group and even Andre because he knew that we loved each other and uh, and, and we, we he also knew we loved his music. Well, he said that uh, how can we – the idea was we, we were giving everything we had and we're thinking about them. How can we help them? He said we didn't get paid. We did it for a spiritual thing to try and change people's lives to help them. And when I yeah. saw that and the great things that came out of it, the whole experience changed my life. That's how I met Andre Crouch, and that's how I wound up moving to Los Angeles to become and became a producer. It all started by serving and trying to help less fortunate people. I mean, yes. I mean, Jimmy Hill. What, what was, what did, what was the love that? Can you give an example of of the love that he exuded? That was, that was just his aura after you know he had been saved. Well, he was the kind of guy, and I can't think of all the many examples that I could give you right now, but he would he would do anything for you. Even if he just met you, he would do that. But especially to me, because we had worked some together in the past, uh, he felt a lot of compassion for me, and he knew the pain I was going through at the time. And he would just offer to do anything, you know, and we, we didn't even live that close together. I wasn't really technically in Oklahoma City. I was on the outskirts, and he would come out to check on me all the time. Uh, little did I know he was praying for me big time, way before I had discovered the open door. And uh, he was not only praying for me, he was praying for the whole uh, band, Third Avenue Blues Band, uh, for our souls to be healed and 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 to find peace, you know, in God. And after I became a part of the Open Door, I was playing my fretless bass there. It was just a piano and my fretless bass and a singer. Uh, I, I was totally happy, and uh, I just felt like Jimmy had shown me a new way to live. And uh, so we started praying for the rest of the guys, and sooner than later, they all started coming around. Wow. I had a chance to talk to Bill and to talk to Harlan and Fletch. You know, we, we all had some very good, serious conversations. And uh, I'm just so glad they they came to the open door and joined us once again. It was like the Third Avenue Blues Band, but without the blues so much. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, this band, Sunlight, are there, are there any tapes of this band? Yes, we, we did an album uh, that did pretty well, I believe. Uh, it was considered one of the uh, kind of, what's the word, Deb? Top 10 gospel album? Uh, I mean, you know, maybe but... groundbreaking for Christian music. Well, and what, and what was what was the what did what did the critics say was groundbreaking? About? I mean, I I got to hear this stuff. You, you, there was an LP that came out. I didn't even know yeah. that. Wow. There, there was a heavy uh, soulful or blues influence, but there was also jazz influence. There's a couple of songs where man Harlan just stretched out. Oh my! I got to hear this immediately, man. Are you? What year did it come out? Do you know, Deb? <laughs> Light album. <laughs> I'll look it up. You know what? I'll, I'd be happy to send you. Oh my I god, think, dude! I, I just need to. Yeah, I. I that. You know, I want to ask you something. Um, you know, Pat Martino is a dear friend of mine, and he in the seventies uh, was having like like migraine headaches that um were debilitating, <clears throat> and again, he um, was really arguably one of the top jazz guitarists in the in the world well, he was a fantastic guitarist and uh and you know but he was getting irate because of these um these headaches and um and and at that time psychotherapy especially uh, for mental you know people that they his parents and other people just assumed he was depressed and so um it's really quite remarkable they they put him in locked wards he had electric shock therapy. 
And then in 19, he moved to California. I uh, thought maybe the sun would help. Um, he was, you know, it got so bad in 1980 that he went to a hospital and they said, the doctor said, you know, basically we have two hours to operate or your brain's going to explode. You have a tumor the size of a pear behind your right ear. Which oh, my had, God. Okay, which had been causing that. I don't know if you know this story because, I mean. No, I never heard that. Oh, this is incredible. So so he he elects to go back to Philadelphia and have the surgery there. And, again, he's been, his career was already a dozen years in. Many guitar awards, many guitars. I mean, just world class. And when he, after the operation, when he awoke, he opened his eyes and there were these people staring at him and he had no idea who they were. It was his mom and dad. And he had completely forgotten how to play the guitar. There was a DVD out there. There's a, there's a documentary on him. Uh, Joe Pesci used to come as a doo-wop singer, but anyway, his memory was gone. He did not know how to play the guitar. He was just like, he had to relearn everything. And it took him about seven years to get back to full strength. But the point was, he was telling me in the early eighties, he goes, you know, Jake, I could have sued all those people that misdiagnosed me and gave me all that shock therapy and did all that stuff. And he goes, what would that have done? It would have done nothing. He goes, I would have, he goes, I would have wound up paying the lawyers and gotten caught in all this sort of grievance as opposed to just being in the moment and trying to re you know, cultivate some kind of love of something. And as it turns out, uh, computers helped him regain his love of composition. And then he got the guitar and started to play again I will say that right now he he's in a very precarious health situation that I'm I'm very always concerned about. He's a dear man. I just wonder if a um, couple questions. Um, once Jimmy really once you connected with Jimmy, did the depression lift? And were was some of the depression due to the fact that you really felt like all you wanted to do was give it your all in music? And yet society and or the people closest to you always thought you were some misguided, you know, just going down the, why would you want to do that, Hadley? Why don't you just go into something safe? Why don't you go and do something that's going to make money? And, and you'd never felt that. And so, I mean, did you, here's the point, did, did, did you have any trauma that obviously you tried to poison yourself, but did, were, were you misunderstood, which led to the depression? And then once you met Jimmy, did, did that darkness actually completely lift? Okay, well, let me kind of give you a sequence yeah. here. Um, I was painfully shy, always was, uh, in junior high and high school. And because of this, I didn't know how to really talk to girls. So I didn't very much. I did have a couple of serious girlfriends during that time, but in general, people thought I was very aloof and stuck up. But that was so far from the truth. Mm. I was just shy and, uh, you know, felt awkward. Now, luckily, through all the years of playing, especially with Neil Diamond in front of uh, huge arena crowds and stuff, <laughs> I've yeah, got you got over that. that, yeah. Yeah, but people are surprised when I tell them that. But I was painfully shy, and it was like the guitar was one thing I could kind of hang my hat on and say, I'm pretty good at this. You could get stuff out of your system, definitely, yeah. Yeah, uh, but it got so bad with the depression that all I wanted to think about was music. I didn't want to think about the rest of life, you know. Now that's that's pretty bad, and like you said, sometimes you don't even want to get out of bed, you know, it's that bad. Mm -hmm. And I did have some electroshock treatments my, myself. You did? See, that was very commonplace. I mean, it's amazing th to hear that stuff. I mean, the idea that that was going to somehow, you know, <laughs> shock you out of your, de your depression, it's like... Uh, it, well, supposedly what it does is it, it kind of it puts your brain in a neutral position. Uh, what happens to depression, uh, people that are plagued with depression, it's a downward spiral, and it's the same thoughts keep circling around in your mind. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're all negative. 
and you get more and more hopeless. Well, the shock treatment would be like a shock to your brain that would stop the cycle. In other words, you could start out with a clean slate. As interesting, far as interesting. It would stop the loop. Yes. Wow. That's what it was designed for. Now, some of the side effects would be temporary uh, memory loss, but I find I, you know, I had a number of those, and I find that I can still remember, you know, early, very early childhood memories. So I don't totally give it a bad, uh, you know, a bad uh, name for that. You, but I also don't, I want people to realize, like, that it's not, uh, is it something that, I don't want to say you, that you, you're not mired in it today. It, 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 it just, at that point when you tapped into Jimmy, and then eventually at the at the open door, did you stop beating yourself up and and sort of realize that you were you you had found your purpose maybe in life a little bit and in terms yeah. of just serving the music and serving people that are less fortunate? Yes, I, but that kind of stuff didn't happen immediately for me mm-hmm. because I lived so long in that total state of depression. Uh, It takes a while to really uh, reverse that. And uh, I had some help, but the most help I had was from my friends at the open door and even my bandmates in in sunlight because everyone prayed for everyone and loved everyone. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of musicians by nature are melancholy. Sure. And that can kind of lend itself to a, a soulful way of playing, I believe. So, uh, well, I want to ask I'm, you something. I, this is so important, Hadley. It's just so funny that it's just cosmic that we're talking today because one of my dear friends, Neil Casal, who is a, a very gifted guitar player um, and quite successful in the music industry, in a totally different music industry than someone like you or Max was involved with. Um, he tragically uh, took his own life uh, in the fall of of 2019. And, you know, no one's ever going to completely understand why. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, he gave of himself. He gave and gave and gave. But he didn't leave any room, in my mind, for self-care, for self-love. I mean, did you get to a point when you – I guess what I'm saying is did you have to learn to love yourself? Yes. And how did you do that? Because that's that's the hardest. To me, like, what happened was he might have gotten into a situation where he didn't know how to extricate himself from it. And because he never left any real room for self-care or self-love, he checked out. And, I'm, I mean, to me, I think it's important because it's prayer is important. It's huge. It's vibrational. It's beyond. But you do have to have be able to love yourself, you know, and... and Obviously, you do. You know. And for me, it was when I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loved me, I thought, how can I not love myself? Hmm. You know, God doesn't make mistakes. Hmm. And at that point, it was looking up to one who was higher than I, one who's actually infallible. And if he chooses to love me, how can I not love myself and other people? Talking to Hadley Hawkinsmith here on the Jake Feinberg Show, one, really one of my highest honors in in, in this young uh, year. Uh, you know, um, Jake, I want to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry it took a long Hadley, time. Hadley, you don't to- got to apologize. I actually, you know what's so great? I was like clearly not going to, you know, I wasn't despondent. But I it was like Hadley really, like he dusted me. Like he he's not into it. Like I gave up. I actually gave up hope. Of, even though I wanted it so badly, you know, I called you on the. You know, like it's not. It's okay. I just it went on. And then, out of the blue, God's work. Max called me. He's like, hey man. He's like Hadley's up for the interview. I'm like, nice man. <laughs> so I, well, I like it's okay, man. I'm like I. I the right yeah. time. I think this is the right time. It is the right time. Exactly. Exactly. But I just wanted you to know I wasn't trying 
trying to be hard to get or any of that kind of money. Hey, you know what, man? It's all good. Like, you know, a, a lot of people, to me, you know, all good things and all good time. And, and um, you know, I, you know, Hadley, do you th- we only have about 10 minutes. Do you think we could do set two next week? Because I actually, there's a ton of stuff I, I didn't get to with you. Sure, that would be fine, Jake. I really enjoy talking to you. Okay, I mean, so good. I mean, knowledgeable man. Well, no, I'm telling you, man. This is. I want to end this session, this set. Uh, one more question for you, um, and that is, you know, like I, I when Max talked to me about being a Christian, what that means to him. It was like service. It was like the most pure form of service. It was the most eloquent way of leading a spiritual life. And, you know, I'm a spiritualist. I I definitely don't subscribe to a monotheistic religion per se. I, I believe I have certain beliefs, but I don't try to push them on other people. Ultimately, I try to inspire other people and make people happy. Maybe bring up emotions that they're not even aware of. And sometimes that can... Sometimes people get really, you know, you're not really aware of, you know, whatever. The point is, what is, like, I remember, I don't know if you know David Friesen. He's an incredible upright bass player, uh, uh, jazzer. And he, you know, he talked about just being so um, tired of man's view of God and the vanity that has seeped into our society. And he's your generation of musician. And he went on this beautiful, I'll send you the interview. He t- talks so beautifully about all these things that sort of culminated in, in his recognition of what his perp- what God's purpose was for him and like kind of what you said, his God's love of him. There are no mistakes. I just would love you to talk to people who, um, you know, who consider themselves um, people that lead a life of faith, especially a Christian faith, how to lead and be a shepherd and not a sheep and how to be objective and still stay true to your faith without just believing dogma and then believing that that's, you can check out after that. Because if you stop, you never, you've never stopped being a critical thinker. That's the point. Like you've all, not at all. And that's the key. So talk about that. Yeah. I, there is so much to learn even in just this life. But, I mean, if you're talking about God or God's truth, there's so much to learn. So I'm, I'm always open. I'm open to, to learning more, and I'm open to saying, wow, that particular thing I believe was just wrong, and then discard it. Um, but, you know, getting back to, like, the, the scriptures and stuff, uh, the scriptures are beautiful because they they tell us to actually prefer others to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Which sounds oh that's real nice. Yeah, right, right, right. To actually live that. I know, man. I love that's it. That's huge, you know. And uh, but that's God's heart. That's His heart. And even though He is God, He is the source of everything. He's not really proud about it. In fact, he tells us he's humble. And I mean, it was Jesus Christ who washed the disciples' funky feet that had been walking in that sweaty desert. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, he was, dude, he was, he was dealing with, the, with the, the riffraff, you know? Sure he was, and that's why a lot of the Pharisees didn't want to hang around him, because they said it. Well, he he should know this woman's a prostitute. What's he talking to her for? Exactly. Know? How did you learn over time? You know, because you know Andre Crouch comes. Well, that's a, we're going to pick this up in set two. But it's just like, how did you learn to? Did you have to walk away from certain <clears throat> spiritual congregation situations because you felt the dogma to conform was just too strong, and you were going to lose the ability to? objectively learn and keep thinking and learning? Um, Especially when you got out to the West Coast. I mean, the open door was kind of in itself a a magical place. You know, there's not a lot of... Yeah, it was. It was magical, but it was magical for a time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't meant to be 
immortalized and, and for us to get stuck right where we were then, although it was a beautiful place for us at the time. It's going to be in one of my books, dude. It's going to be chronicled. That 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 time in history, that is the most magical place, man. Uh, anyway, I know what you're saying. Yes, but you know, we humans, sometimes we want to create something, recreate it, uh, something that was beautiful. And it doesn't really work that way. If we were tried to do that, you know, <laughs> have have little meetings, I mean... It would still be great, but mm-hmm. it wouldn't be the old door. <laughs> you know, it's uh, time is, uh, what is it the Chinese proverb says? A uh, caught fish is a dead fish. Well, I should know this, too. My The mother of my children is, is Taiwanese, but I don't know that one. I mean, I mean it's, it's all moments in time. Um, but, yeah, I, I think we're – let's – let me uh, – you know, let me uh, get this up. Uh, I'll get this this up tonight. But we will devote an entire set to to we'll go in a whole different direction and just dwell on the music. I just I felt from the beginning um, when Max told me that story that uh, I said these are the kind of these are my people. You know, these are the people that I um, you know I, I want to build a cadre of cats who you know, have been on this earth longer than I have and, but that lead with their heart and that play re- and then, and then ultimately communicate musically. I mean, that's what it's about. And it's, uh, I don't know. I just had a ball, man. I can't wait to do it again. Oh man. It'll be great to do it again. And can I just add one thing? We Please. covered the topic of depression uh, and it's a severe problem right now. Huge. A lot of people. And you know, one guy kind of changed my life one night because I was feeling very suicidal. And this was even after I had tried to take my life once. And he said, he said, Hadley, what's the rush? Hmm. You can kill yourself tomorrow. You can kill yourself anytime. What's the rush? Why do you have to do it tonight? Because what happens is people get overwhelmed for a certain period of time, and that's when they're really vulnerable to taking their own lives. But if you can just think of it that way and say, it doesn't have to be tonight, you know, let's see what tomorrow brings. You know, man, that it's so beautiful to say that. I'm thinking of my friend Neely Casal, who, who I talked about earlier, that unfortunately he didn't. He didn't have that person next to him to say, you know, you can see what tomorrow brings. You can wait a day. Um, much love to you, Hadley. It was so good to hang. We'll do, I'll, I'll text you. We'll, we'll, we'll get something set up for next week, all right? Most excellent. All right, man. Talk Take it easy. Bye-bye. Later. Two down, one to go here on the Jake Feinberg Show. Uh, we will be back with Billy Childs after this.